family, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. And I think that if Brother Mickey was here with us today in the flesh, that he would have greeted us all at the door. Has anybody told you today? So turn to your neighbor 
and ask them, has anybody told you today? And if somebody hadn't told you, tell your neighbor, I love you and Jesus loves you. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, we come today, Lord, and we gather today to celebrate the graduation and to celebrate Brother Mickey Evans' life, the legacy, Lord, that he left because it will live on in all of our hearts and all of our lives and in the lives of every man that comes through this program. He is so faithful to work in for 53 years. So Lord, today we ask that you'd let our hearts rejoice because we know his heart is rejoicing today. As he looks at all those that are gathered here today, Lord, but more than that, now he can see into eternity all those that went before him. So Lord, today we ask for your peace over the family. We ask, Lord, for your love abound in our hearts. And Lord, let us have the memory of the big smiling cowboy that loved us all deeply, that always reminded us without fail that Jesus loved us and he did too. We ask, Lord, for your favor in Jesus' name. We all said, Amen. My eyes are a little foggy this morning. So are my glasses. <laughs> but Mickey Evans was born in Okeechobee where he began his career working as a meat cutter while still in junior high school. He graduated from Okeechobee High School in 1950 and he made a profession of faith at the Grace Brethren Church in January of 1951 and married his high school sweetheart, Gourmet Campbell. Only a week later, he was a pilot who survived three plane crashes. He finished seminary at Carson Newman and was ordained at the First Baptist Church of Okeechobee. His first pastorate was at Indiantown Baptist Church where he was serving when he received a vision to build a city of refuge for alcoholics and their families to find hope and healing. For the past 52 years, thousands of men and their families have come through Dunkley Memorial Camp and found freedom from their addictions through the grace of God, of whom I am one and very proud to be today. The ministry <coughs> model developed at Dunkley has been replicated in several other states and countries. And Brother Mickey, as he is known, had a smile and a heart that left an impression of love with everyone that he met. He had a worldwide impact for Christ, and he has survived by his devoted wife of 62 years, Laura Mae Evans, his children, Clint and Nancy Evans, Dean and Rosalia Evans, David and Chicky Evans, Laura Lee and Chris Bryan, and his grandchildren, Ira Evans, Amanda Frank Seaton, Jennifer Evans, and Zeke Bryan, and stepbrother Billy Belville. An extended family include Lenora Walker, Betty Gordon, Kim and Rick Trask, Jerry and Juanita Walker, Gary Gwynn and Tuff, Kelly Marsh, and Tammy Brickler, James, Suzanne, and Matt Morton, along with numerous cousins and kinfolks around Okeechobee. There are also innumerable spiritual sons and daughters who cherished him as a father in the faith. He is preceded in death by his mother, Edna Walker, Belleville, his father, Albert, Evans and two infant sisters, Louise and Margaret, and grandson Christopher Dean Evans. In our word, we read that no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. Brother Mickey put it another way, and at every graduation we ever had, he always repeated this and had us repeat after him. So in honor of Brother Mickey today, would you repeat after me, 
I am not now what once I was. Nor am I yet what I'm going to be. But what I am, I am by grace. One day I shall see him face to face. And I will be like him perfectly. I once was dead but thought I lived. But now I live though dead I am. For I live in whom, in whom I died. For I to the Lord am crucified. And my life and my song will always be Calvary's Lamb. Brother Vicky loved us all. I don't think there was ever a person that ever met him that he didn't make them feel like they're the most special person on the planet. And I think all of us have been a witness to that in his life. So today, in honor of him, as we go through this service, let's take that love with us today when we leave here. Let's carry on his legacy of loving the unlovable, ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ, of healing to those that are hurt and wounded, and embrace the ones the Lord sends to us every day. In Jesus' name, amen. hungry. You gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. I was a stranger. You invited me in. Naked. And you clothed me. I was sick. And you visited me. I was in prison. Brother Mickey's been fulfilling those scriptures for over 50 years. He loved us. He encouraged us. He trained us. He corrected us. And he fathered us. We've been the recipient of those blessings from him. You know, before I, my brother Mickey got to where he couldn't get out and travel or drive, we used to go, used to take him out on visits to visit his friends in Okeechobee and Clewiston, all around the lake. We'd take that suburban. We'd put, we'd put a bunch of, a uh, bunch of jars of cane syrup in the back fill the back seat with black eyed peas and the good busy. And on those trips, we had a lot of time to talk. And I remember I was telling him about how many men were in the program. He was always interested in that. He was always interested in the other ministries that had been birthed out of Duncan. And I tried to give him as much information on those as I could. And I was sharing that with him one day. As we were riding, tears came up in his eyes. He said, you know, I never dreamed of this. He said, when we started the camp, he said, I thought in two, maybe three years at the most. We'd have all the alcoholics in Okeechobee and Indian down sobered up and saved. And we could go back and pastor a church. 
and he was silent for a few seconds. And then he said, but the Lord had a different plan. And I'm glad he did. If not going to shut down three years after it started, a lot of us wouldn't be here today. I'm thankful that Laura May, you and Brother Mick were faithful to that vision and that plan. You've affected multitudes of lives. And I remember him saying, you know, when we first started the camp, everybody thought that I was crazy. I was a crazy young preacher trying to sober up a bunch of alcoholics. He said, you know, I kind of felt like, I feel like I kind of felt like Noah when he was building the ark in the, in the desert. And as I thought about that, God's plan. Noah had ark, and God had Noah to build that ark because he knew what was coming. He knew that the world was going to be flooded with water. God had Brother Mickey to build that camp because he knew what was coming. The world was going to be flooded with drugs. Twenty-five years after Brother Mickey started that camp, the first flood came. Now, I worked with the alcoholics, all of us before then. And when I'm talking about a flood, Brother Mickey didn't call it a flood, he called it a tsunami. And it was. Crack cocaine. Methamphetamines. Prescription painkillers. It was overwhelming. But that little camp was a refuge for many men. There are many wives who got their husbands back. Many children who got their fathers back. And many parents who got their sons back. Brother Mickey had no idea what was coming when he started building that camp in 1962. But God did. And God had to have a man who was faithful, who was trustworthy, who had a heart after his heart. And that was Brother Nick. Thousands of men have experienced a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just at that camp, but in other ministries that were birthed out of that camp. Thousands. I was talking to Brother Mickey's friends the other day, and he said, how many men you reckon Brother Mickey's affected? He said, I have no idea. But I know this. The effect and influence of Brother Mickey on men's lives does not stop because he's passed away. It goes to you guys. You have the ministries. Brother Mickey helped you with. It goes to you guys in the program to carry the message when you get out. So that crazy young preacher is now a wise boy apostle.
Also, when we were on these trips, Brother Mickey knew that sooner or later he was going to go be with the Lord. Most of the time he wanted it to be sooner. But he called the staff and you guys who went out and ministered. He had a name for y'all. He called you Young Joshua's. And he was proud of you. And he was excited for you. He was proud of what God had done in, in your life. He was proud of your commitment to the Lord and to the Lord's work. And he was excited about what you were going to do in the future. The young Joshua's. The Bible says that young men will see visions, old men will dream dreams. Brother Mickey was a young man, he had a vision. He was an old man, he had a dream. The vision was Duncan Memorial Camp. The dream was many Duncan Memorial Camp. And as we go forward, this next generation, you have been through the tribulation of crack cocaine, methamphetamines, prescription medication. You have come out of that. And you are the ones to take us on. He called you young Joshua's. When they buried Moses after 30 day mourning, the Lord said to Joshua, My servant Moses is dead. You get up and arise across the Jordan. This next generation is going to have a lot of Jordans. But God will see you through. He will see you through. And what we've started in, in, in 1962 is going on today. There's been a lot of changes in the buildings and the environment. But there's one thing that has not changed and will not change. And that's this. We will always be a Christ-centered ministry. I'm going to miss Brother Mickey. But I'm going to see him again. He's going to have the table set for us when we get up there, boys. You know that, don't you? To the family, Clint, Dean, David, Lord, thank you for allowing your daddy to be a daddy to us. Lord, may you loved us, gave for us. You made tireless sacrifices. Thank you is does doesn't even scratch the surface for what we have here, what we what we the way we love you. But I want to tell you this. You, like Brother Mickey, you've got great treasures stored up in heaven for you when you get there. Thank you.
morning. I like to say that I, I love Mickey, but it's like when you say you love the Lord, it's really your response to Him loving you. You can be around Mickey without Him loving on you and unconditionally. And I'd like to share a song. Mickey was a great picture painter. He, he spoke in stories and you felt like you were right there. He spoke of heaven where those of us who have entered into relationship with Jesus are going. And you felt like you were right there to describe it in expressions of his enjoyment of what the Lord was revealing to him through his scriptures and through his life. And he spoke of this song. And I'd like to share it with you this morning about a place that he is rejoicing. And that we can go and rejoice. We can rejoice with him now. He wants us to. Mickey wants to, and so does the Lord. But we can go and, and be in eternity with Him if we do the same thing that Mickey did, invite Jesus into our hearts. There's a place where He has prepared for us that we can go and be unconditionally loved forever and ever. You the lady.
nominated for this because I'm the baby of the family. I guess my brothers figured I got spoiled so much growing up that it was time for me to step up and do something hard. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of y'all for being here. Um, and my daddy would be humble if he overcome the love in this arena. On behalf of our family, I would especially like to thank all those who are here that have worked tirelessly behind the scenes to make this such a beautiful service possible. On a personal note, I want to say thank you to my husband, Chris. Not only helped me put these words together, but for honoring his father-in-law in very practical ways and ensuring that he received the best care possible in the last years of his life. What a gift. What a gift it's bestowed on me to have Mickey Evans for a father. Um, God's been so gracious uh, in allowing me 42 years to learn from him, to be loved by him, and to learn how to love by his example. And I never take for granted, I'm sure when I was younger, I did, but uh, for many years now, I've never taken for granted the fact that it was, it was very rare for somebody my age um, to still have both of their parents living, and more than that, still living with each other. You know, it's, it's hard to find. And uh, I, I was just um, been so blessed by my family. And uh, there, are, there are so many wonderful things that could be said about Daddy, and I'm sure um, those will be mentioned. Uh, and there's memories that we've had over my lifetime that I'll treasure for throughout eternity. This morning, I uh, feel like I have the unique perspective to share with you all some things that Daddy never did. At least this is as far as I can remember things that he never did. He never ate at the chow hall at the camp. That is, until everyone else had been gone through the line and been served first. He never passed up a vehicle stranded on the road. He wasn't much of a mechanic, so if you happened to be the lucky one riding with him, you would probably be the one changing the tire. Uh, he never knew if he might be entertaining angels unaware. So he treated everyone, every stranger, like they were. He never missed an opportunity to go to jail. It was actually one of his favorite places to be, which is uh, hard for a lot of people to understand. Um, he never missed a chance to feed a homeless person sitting outside of a gas station on the, the trips like Mr. He was talking about. Chris, um, you know, there was, there was, uh, if he saw a need, there was no way he could try to need it, to meet it, if he had it in him, you know, um, sometimes that becomes, uh, overburdening for somebody that sees needs even when they're not expressed or, evident from the outside. Uh, he never missed an opportunity to create a traffic jam at the camp. All you staff that have ever been pulled up in the middle of the road, not the side of the road, the middle of the road, be stopped and you ask you how your day was going and of course if anybody had told you yet. So, you know, the staff knew that if they were in a hurry, if, if uh, you know, they had to be somewhere. They'd make a quick detour when they saw him coming. You know, uh, they, they knew they'd be there for a while with him. Um, he never, he never had the heart to turn anybody away if they truly wanted help. 
and I never, ever saw him give up on anybody. No many how many times they'd been around the mountain, the mountain of addiction, the mountain of our selfish nature, which we all make several trips, but no matter how far somebody had gone down, even if they had been up on that mountain at one time, he never put boundaries around and said, you've taken too many trips. He, uh, he believed that loving people was more, much more important than fixing people. Sometimes that's even harder. Uh, we all like to fix people, but it, sometimes it's harder to love them. Uh, he never blessed a meal at our home or at, at any kind of meeting without first inviting Christ to be the guest of honor. He always knew his place, and that was low Jesus. Um, he never had a need um, that his God didn't meet, and that he doubted that his God would be able to meet. You know, the, uh, he was talking about, you know, everybody said it was crazy. Uh, to go out there, and one of the things they told him is, you're going to take your kids, your wife and your kids out there, and you're going to, they're going to starve to death. They're going to starve out in that swamp. Now, the irony of that is, you know, most of us have had trouble with obesity all of our life. <laughs> not, not the other way around. So God has just, you know, abundantly and over provided for our needs. Um, He never passed up an opportunity to serve as Savior, to visit the sick and those in prison. Um, many a man has received a personal written letter from him while sitting in a jail cell. And, uh, I don't know where he fell in the time, but he, he had his priorities um, most of the time. Uh, he never passed up a chance to go on a mission trip, you know, and uh, no matter how dangerous. He was in Cuba the day that Castro took over, which was a dangerous place for an American to be at that time. Um, he swam with piranha to minister to leper colonies in the Amazon. Uh, I was with him one time when he was nearly arrested in Russia. And the KB, KGB were still very much alive at that point, although they wouldn't claim to be. But, um, he never failed to apologize if he, had realized, if he realized that he'd hurt someone or admit when he was wrong. Might take him a little while, but he always did. Uh, he never put plans, programs, or productivity ahead of people. He had great plans. He wanted the camp to be productive, but it never got, it never took the place above minister because he knew that's why we were there. He knew that these things didn't matter because they don't last forever, but people do. He never believed that a church was a building that you went to. And uh, for, you know, I'm sorry for you Baptists out there, but, you know, going to Baptist seminary and being raised, uh, you know, uh, trained Baptist, that, that was a total paradigm shift for him when the Lord revealed that to him. That it's not about how big the buildings are or how many people or what your... Sunday school program is, or, you know, he believed that uh, there weren't spectators that came to church. He believed that every single one of us um, were ministers of the gospel. And uh, so he didn't, you know, he didn't just um, put that responsibility on, the, on all the preachers uh, because he knew that um, the rest of us could touch people that the preachers couldn't touch in each of our lives and in each of our daily circles. Um, he not once 
I'm not once I know this for a fact. Never passed up an occasion to sample some nanner pudding. Uh, in fact, he, he became known as somewhat of a local connoisseur of that particular um, delicacy. And I know many of you sweet ladies have, have brought um, your recipes for him to try out, and he uh, thoroughly enjoyed each one of them. Um, he never met a plane that he couldn't crash. He never met a cookie that he wouldn't eat. He never, he never learned to turn on a computer, and he didn't want to, and he made that very clear, that nobody was going to talk to him into that. Um, he was quite happy and uh, probably quite clever to leave that aggravation up to the rest of us. Um, he never seen him look at his watch, either when he was talking to somebody in person or I've seen him on the phone for hours. I never saw him look at his watch. He had time for people. Um, he never tried to hold back his tears. Um, his motto, which many of you can recite by heart, is uh, if your eyes leak, your head won't swell. So uh, he, you know, um, he didn't think it was uh, a bad thing to share his emotions and just be transparent and be honest about who he was. Um, Mama can verify this. He never made it back home at the, at the end of the day with more than $5 in his pocket. He, but he had at least three, and my brothers know what those three were about. But, um, yeah, he found some way to um, to just give whatever he had, whether it was money, time, food. Um, yeah. Daddy never missed the opportunity to serve communion, uh, whether it was a gathering of preachers at a net meeting, whether it was a bunch of cowboys at a livestock market. Uh, or whether, whether it was with individual prisoners on death row. He loved to share the body and the mind. Um, oh, this is a um, page mix up in there. Right He never missed an opportunity to go hunting either, and um, he was so grateful um, to a lot of the ranchers around that would just allow him to go hunt, and most of the time he didn't kill nothing. Not because he wasn't a good shot, and uh, but he just enjoyed being in the woods, alone, with friends, um, you know, cooking sausage with Tay and Emery, just... Um, that was where his heart was. He did not like to be in town. <laughs> and especially not in a place like Palm Beach. We sent him there one time to have some pictures made with Mama that they had given us a portrait. <laughs> and uh, we talked about a fish out of water. Uh, they, that didn't go so well. But um, anyway. Uh, he never wasted anything he would kill, and uh, so we beat Gator, and I'm sure the Statue of Limitations is up on that, so I'm not worried about it. We beat many, many Gators. Uh, you know, venison, Heidi Wind Rooters, anything that would fill the table, he'd bring home, and, uh, and there's someone actually, um, there he is on this stage, that had the pleasure of um, eating some bobcat that Daddy had skinned on one of their hunting trips, and he shall remain nameless. Uh, one of the, the main things that has really impressed me about Daddy over the years and that I really can't think of really anybody or maybe one or two people uh, that I've known over the years 
that um, he never had a bad word to say about anybody. Um, he, uh, you know, sometimes you would sometimes you even try to fish it out of him, you know, because you knew he knew. His people shared the, the the deepest things of their hearts with him. They trusted him, and you know we're all curious, so we try to. You know, get him to drop a hint here and there what was going on. Yeah, they wouldn't do it. Wouldn't do it. Um, now that's a trait that I really hope to cultivate more in my life, and maybe by the time I'm 82, I'll have it down pat, but I'm certainly not there yet. Um, he he didn't have too many critics, but the ones that he had, he treated them with kindness. He um, was never one to to pay back for any way, shape, or form. Um, but he could still give out that tough love, like that she talked about. You know, um, if you saw that nose start to flare, and the whites of the eyes and the teeth, you knew you were in big trouble. Um, but I was sure it was over, it was over, and he went back, and even in that, he was showing love, you know, because we needed it. Um, he never allowed Mama to go to sleep without a good night kiss, and he never missed a chance to tell any of us that I love you the mostest. Last Friday morning, we all lost the hero of the faith, the hero to, to me. But uh, him being gone, it's going to leave a big crater-sized hole in our hearts. But you know what? He he made sure we knew what to fill that hole up with. And he knew that Jesus could more than fill any hole he left behind. So, again, I just thank everybody for being here. The, such, um, the love and support that we've felt over the past several weeks. Um, I can't even describe how, what, what it means to us. And um, just bless y'all and uh, love you the most.